All right, what is up, Redwood AP, Mr. Vera and Mr. Eskridge? Coming at you guys with Chapter 8, The Market Revolution. So we have made it. The United States of America is a country. We have a constitution. We have fought the British twice, beat them once, tied them a second time. And it looks like we are here to stay. So today uh, we're going to focus on kind of the building, the modeling of America, and how the market economy really drives uh, the forces of labor and the home life of America in the first century. So without further ado, here is Mr. Eskridge. Hey guys. Um, all right. So as we go through this chapter, we're really seeing kind of um, the juxtaposition between the positive things that happened with the market revolution. And we do have um, a lot of infrastructure being built within the United States, trains, roads, canals, all those other things, um, steamboats, so navigating rivers in a more effective way. But we also have a bunch of negative um, side effects as well, where we're starting to see really uneven um, class structures. We're have, starting to get a growing um, division between the really wealthy and the really poor. And so just to kind of um, focus on some of those aspects um, today. All right, so the market revolution fulfilled really big expectations um, of progress the United States had after um, the revolution, after the early part of the republic. If you remember, things were kind of shaky um, as far as the economy. The United States was trying to figure out, was it going to be um, produce goods for itself? Was it going to continue to um, trade internationally, or was it going to be a blend of both? And ultimately, what it ends up being is a blend of both. Um, but during this chapter, we really see the, the growth of a domestic industry. And we're starting to see regional differences between the north and the south. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about those things as well. All right, so within states, we have states, banks that are really sponsoring um, the construction of roads, canals, um, railroads, all those different things, which really helps out the states. Um, as you read, we also, we have a lot more of those investments being done in the north than we do in the south. Um, and that'll play a, a big part later, especially in the Civil War, um, where the north is really able to kind of out-transport and out-produce um, the south. Um, there's a lot of counterfeit, so because of, there wasn't one really standard form of currency, so we have different um, types of bills that are going around, different coinage, and so that's kind of caused issues um, with counterfeit, with fraud, all those different things. Um, and we also see um, kind of une uneven economic growth. And we have really highs where the economy is doing really good, it's booming, and then it um, tanks and crashes. And during this time, the American people are kind of um, refusing to believe that um, that the problem was capitalism, that it was this uneven economic development, uh, but that you know there was just something that needed to be fixed, and that was mainly to just continue to push, continue to build more factories, continue to move out west. Um, so um, yeah, we see this up and down um, economically. Okay, so the transportation revolution um, after the War of 1812, um, Americans are really starting to build this new infrastructure. If you remember um, the the American system in which um, Certain congressional members, um, mostly those that are in the West, started to um, advocate for this idea of the American system of building roads, canals, um, transportation networks that would allow um, the, a greater and easier transportation of goods. So we see on um, the Great Lakes, the Ohio, Ohio River Valley are connected um, to Eastern markets. So we're seeing those Western farmers having more access to Eastern markets. Um, so that's a good thing for the farmers. It's a good thing for the Eastern markets as well. Um, and the United States really kind of you know, leads the way in um, transportation um, development at this time. Um, and I said, as I said, um, we have a lot more transportation in the north than the south. So just keep that kind of um, couched in the back of your mind. And so here's a map that just shows um, these railroad networks, the canals and the navigable rivers, which we have more navigable, navigable rivers in the south. Um, and that's one of the reasons we don't see as much railroad development. Um, but again, just keep this kind of picture or map in your head. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Vieira, who's going to continue. All right, sticking with the communication and the connectedness that the United States is going through, there is uh, most of the growth that is taking place is done through different technological advancements during the time. Um, you have the steamboat. Steamboat was really important because uh, weather and water current are no longer really a concern. The steamboat could go upstream. It could go upstream relatively fast, and although... At the beginning of its invention, the steamboat leads to quite a few explosions. Uh, as that technology gets better and that technology becomes perfected, you begin to see rivers being uh, used up and down the river, large numbers for trade. Uh, by uh, the Civil War, the United States is connected via the telegraph from east coast to west coast and north to south. 
um, people are able to send messages, people are able to communicate uh, much faster than they had in the past when they were relying on horses or the Pony Express um, or even trains to get their message across. Now, communication is much faster. But sticking with something that Mr. Eskridge just said, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the Civil War, communication and railroads and the telegraph, uh, those technologies were utilized far greater to far greater numbers in the northern states than they were in the southern states. Most of the telegraph line that was laid was laid in the northern states. Most of the railroads that were laid were laid in the northern states. And the southern states are going to kind of maintain that old agrarian way of life that had been uh, commonplace in the south since before the Revolutionary War. Um, you get large numbers of, or larger yields in crops because of a couple of inventions, uh, of course, the McCormick's Reaper and then John Deere Steel Plow. And so Americans are producing larger quantities of food. Uh, probably the most important agricultural product of the 19th century is something that you can't eat. I mean, you can try to eat it, but you probably get really sick. And that is cotton. Cotton is cotton pretty much defines the U.S. economy for the first 80 years of the nation's existence. And that wasn't always the case, but there was one invention, the cotton gin, created by Eli Whitney, which really makes cotton more profitable. What used to be the case before the cotton gin was created is that cotton, as you can see, um, the, the white fiber, which is what you use to make um, fabric, you had to hand pick the seeds and the cotton trash, as it was called, away from the cotton. The cotton gin makes that a job that's much easier. You just turn the wheel and the cotton fiber <clears throat> is separated from the cotton trash. So as soon as cotton becomes more profitable, you begin to see an increase in the, de in the demand for slave labor and an increase in the amount of American farmers in the South that are planting cotton. It is an incredibly profitable industry for the United States of America during the 19th century. And it's not just Southern planters that are benefiting from cotton cultivation. Textile mills in the North are where the cotton is, is uh, spun and used to make textiles or fabric that is used in American and European clothing. So King Cotton, as we're gonna call it, really starts to run the United States of America. It runs its economy. And as we'll talk about uh, in future chapters, it begins to really run its politics and its government. Um, and so when the cotton gin is created and began to be put onto Southern farms, it pretty much ensures that slavery is not going anywhere, that slavery is gonna be around for the foreseeable future. All right, guys, um, so just kind of picking up where Mr. Vieira left off. Um, so as he'd mentioned, um, the, the rise of cotton, the, the planting of cotton, cotton, the cultivation of cotton down in the South really fueled um, industrial growth in the North. Um, so we start to have um, changes in the labor system. So prior to um, the revolution and during right after the revolutionary period, most of the products that were created in the United States were done maybe at home um, in someone's shop, um, a shopkeeper, a small um, kind of operation where um, maybe one person did all of the things like a blacksmith or oftentimes we had um, what was called like piecework where maybe I'm going to make up a certain part of it, then I'm going to send it over to Mr. Vieira and he's going to make the other part and then it's going to go um, over to another person and then it's going to be the final product that, doesn't, that is then going to be put to market. And so we start to see um, a change during this time where all of those different steps are put under one roof. Um, we have the advancement of um, textile machines, um, the cotton loom, all those kinds of things, which is interesting how the, the um, how those things were essentially like stolen. Those ideas were stolen from England um, in kind of a, a great American piracy um, drama there. And we have many women that are going to work in these systems. We have the wool system, which really revolu revolutionizes manufacturing. Um, Lowell did something that was unique, not just in the textiles, but also created a community, kind of a, um, there was housing, there was stores, places where um, workers could live. Um, and so we had a lot of um, people moving, a lot of women moving, young women moving off of the farm and into these um, industrial textile um, cities. We also have a lot of people starting to earn wages instead of just producing for themselves um, or kind of the subsistence lifestyle where they're making their own clothes, making um, anything that they need, their food, they're starting to participate in a commercial um, economic system um, in which more and more they're relying on others to produce their goods for them. And they would use wages and, um, you know, being paid 
um, money to take advantage of those, those new All things. right, hey guys, um, we're back. Okay, so just talking about how there's this new system, this new factory system. Um, so not only did it create textiles and create products in a relatively fast manner um, and relatively cheaper as well, um, we start to see um, this system start to create new social structures within the United States. And so we start to see class conflict between the employer and the employees. So traditionally how it had been prior to the, the market revolution, um, there was someone that maybe, you know, they wanted to become a blacksmith or their parents were a blacksmith and they would apprentice, they would work with the master um, craftsman for a while and they developed this really personal um, relationship that oftentimes lasted throughout their lifetime. And we're starting to see the breakdown of that with um, the shift towards wage labor. And so no longer do employers and employees have this kind of um, deep connection with each other where they're, they're really looking out for the good of one another. And so we're starting to see um, conflict where workers are starting to demand, starting to, ri starting to rise up, um, to create unions as best as they could to advocate for better working conditions, better wages, um, better hours, um, all those different things. And then we have employers are, you know, obviously not wanting um, to pay those things, not wanting to cut into their profits um, so much. And they just want the workers to, you know, be happy with um, what they're doing and their conditions. And so we start to see conflict between um, the employees and the employers. And so we we also start to see kind of regional differences, but um, we're in the North, we have quote unquote free labor in which um, the idea was that people could, they freely entered into these you know jobs and they could leave when they wanted to and nothing was holding them there. But that's not really the case. If you think more um, kind of deeply about it, there were certain economic structures and social structures that um, didn't really provide a lot of opportunities for people to to freely move in and out of these different jobs. And oftentimes they were, you know, bound to this because they had to make enough money. And that's why we see women going to work in poorer families and children. And they're really just trying to supplement the, the household income because within this new economy of everything being driven by cash, um, oftentimes families struggle to make ends meet and to provide for themselves. So that's why we're seeing um, a lot more people um, in poor, poor groups starting to work together where we don't really see that um, in the wealthier families. And so we start to develop a middle class um, and all those different things. And so we're also going to see a shift um, in gender roles, where as more and more um, women are starting to go and take jobs, then it's starting to kind of change the, the social structure. Um, we start to see kind of a split between what is the public sphere or the man's sphere, if you will, and that's dealing with, you know, making, making a living, making an income, and also dealing with politics. Um, whereas women were, their, their work was less valued in a way, even though it's probably, I mean, it, arguably it's more important because they're the ones that are holding this household together and the, the husband, the man could not go to work if it wasn't um, for the woman who was, you know, providing food, clothing, um, you know, all those different things so that they could go do that. And so we start to see this, the role of um, the women is, the sphere of women is more centered in the home or this cult of domesticity, where it was the role of women to um, keep the household together, to make good economic decisions, and to make sure that children are growing up um, to be good American republics, and republics, and republics, republicans, there's that word. <laughs> um, all right, and so we're starting to see, as I kind of mentioned, two distinct ways of life that are happening in the North and the South. The South is really going to stick to these, um, their roots of, you know, that um, based on plantation slavery and that white women should not be working out in the fields. And so um, we're having class divisions within the South as well, where um, we don't, that's, that can happen on like large plantations where um, the white women are not they don't have to work out in the fields. They don't have to really participate in those day-to-day -day jobs. But for the most part, um, many Southern women are continuing to um, play a role in the subsistence, um, the subsistence farming and um, doing making clothes at home and doing all those types of things. Um, but again, we're starting to really see these um, regional differences growing between the North and the South. All right, I'm going to turn it back to, to Mr. Vieira. He's going to talk about some new folks that are arriving in the U.S. All right, so during the uh, 19th century, in the middle part of the 19th century, you begin to see a new wave of immigration to the United States of America. And that is really personified in two groups, which I'm going to discuss right now. The first are Irish immigrants. Uh, a devastating potato famine kills about one quarter of the Irish population. And so uh, they, the Irish come to the United States seeking food, seeking any sort of opportunity to feed themselves, to feed their families. And between, you can see the numbers there, about two million Irish immigrants settle in American cities during this time period. In fact, there was one at one point in world history, there were more Irish-born uh, Americans living in Boston 
than there were living in Dublin, which is just crazy to think about. Um, now, Irish immigrants that come to the United States are typically unskilled. And as a, because of that, they typically take the bottom rung of, of northern city jobs, um, the unskilled labor. And so you immediately begin to see class conflict between uh, Irish immigrants and African-Americans who are vying for those low paying, unskilled jobs in factories and textile mills in America's northern cities. Um, and so there, there will be some racial riots during, during this immigration wave, during the Civil War. Uh, between Irish immigrants and uh, other groups. With time, the Irish immigrants become very, really involved and ingrained in city politics. There is a political machine known as Tammany Hall, which really takes advantage of Irish immigrants and uses that group of new Americans to uh, really control New York City for decades during the 19th century. The other group that we're going to talk about are the Germans. Now, Coming to the United States in, in large numbers during the same time period, many were farmers who were displaced by crop failures, but a large chunk of German immigrants are liberal revolutionaries who, because of war and conflict in Germany, uh, had to leave and came to the United States. And many of that number are abolitionists. And so uh, settling in the Midwest and in some northern cities, the German immigrants are really going to be uh, one of the voices leading the abolitionist movement. Uh, now, many of the things that we have in society today, we can track to different immigrant groups, and the German immigrant groups are, are no different. Um, things such as the Christmas tree, kindergarten, and then, of course, my personal favorite, beer, uh, really all come to the United States um, in mass as a result of German immigration. Now, with immigrant groups come stereotypes, comes anti-foreignism, comes this... Um, fear that immigrant groups are changing America. And so you begin to see this nativist wave of Americans who were native born, <laughs> who had um, this anti, the xenophobic sentiment. And so this political cartoon kind of demonstrates that, how you have the Irish and German immigrant represented by a barrel of whiskey and a keg of beer, uh, stealing the ballot box from uh the, the American people. And so nativism really begins in, to, to take root in American social and political life during the middle part of the 19th century. Uh, nativists believe that the, the native born white anglo saxon Protestant Americans are the true Americans and the real Americans. And that this wave of immigrants from Ireland, from German who are uh, Catholic and to a large degree Catholic, are going to change the, the values of the United States. In any time in American history, you give me the decade, I'll give you the immigrant group that is really being um, judged and, and being called the enemy of the nation. And in the 1840s and the 1850s, it was the Irish and the Germans. Uh, this nativist sentiment is so strong that a political party, uh, known as the Know Nothing Political Party, advocates for stricter immigration laws. And and they are able to pass actually some immigration laws and certain quota systems in American uh, in the American government during the 19th century. So that's the gist of chapter eight. Uh, again, sorry about the tardiness of this lecture. We'll try and do better next time. But I hope you guys have a great week and uh, good luck on the reading quiz.